What's up YouTube and welcome to my pickups video for the month of November 2022. This is going to be a pretty light month. Uh, I didn't do a whole lot of travel this month. I had a work trip to the Kansas City area early in the month and actually came home empty-handed as far as games go. I did not buy any games at all. I got a few records but uh, not much to show from that trip at all. Um, and then really just not a whole lot of stuff I found locally or online just with a few exceptions I'm going to talk about in the video here. Um, I'm actually doing some selling right now of some of my Super Nintendo collection, and really it was because I'm doing a big uh, reorganization of how I'm displaying my Super Nintendo stuff. I finally got all my boxed, uh, empty boxes out of my closet, and I'm putting the cartridges back in with them, and ultimately I, that takes up more shelf space, so therefore now I've got a bunch of loose carts that um, I don't really use or play since I'm no longer going for a full set. Um, so I'm actually trying to pare that down currently, and then hopefully that'll make some room for some more desirable stuff for that in the future. So kind of just something I got in progress. But anyways, let's talk about pickups. So first thing I'm going to show is the only thing I got for a newer console this month, uh, which was a PS4 game that came out a few months ago, and I decided to wait for a price drop, and I'm glad I did because I think the current price is where it should be. And that is, of course, the Ninja Turtles Cowabunga Collection for PS4. Uh, this dropped to 20 bucks over kind of like the pre-Black Friday week. Um, GameStop was where I saw the advertisement for, but none of the stores in the whole area had any inventory showing in stock. So I actually gave my money to Target uh, that was running the same special, it turned out, that I found later. So I um, got this from Target and was pretty happy uh, getting it for 20 bucks. Um, as far as the game itself, I mean, I think they did a nice job putting uh, all these, you know, classic cartridge Nintendo titles plus the two arcade games in one compilation. And then try to include a lot of extras in it, uh, but they are kind of flawed as far as um, some of the original manuals and advertisements and things like that that they tried to include uh, because of all the licensing issues that related things cause. So, you know, if you flip through the Ninja Turtles 2 manual for uh, Nintendo, it does not have the Pizza Hut ad, which it should. <laughs> Um, and then if you look at some of the vintage Konami advertising that showed off the Turtles games, if there were other Konami games that had licensed properties such as Tiny Toon Adventures in the ad, they just put black boxes around them in the, uh, the game, which I thought was kind of interesting. So um, it's kind of revisionist history is what I would call this. You know, the games are not 100% accurate. Obviously, they've taken some changes to the games themselves due to licensing as well. Um, but it is nice, you know, for somebody that just wants to have all these games at hand and easy to play. Uh, the other things I took away just from fooling around with it, uh, the original Ninja Turtles arcade game is even cheaper than I thought it was as far as a playing experience. Um, as a kid, I pumped a ton of quarters into it, but I never beat it. And uh, going through it this way and just infinite continuing it, um, I don't know how anybody could ever one credit clear that game. It's just so cheap when you get to the final stages of it. But enjoyed it regardless and finally completed it uh, for just my own sake, I guess. Um, going back and playing some of the games on NES and Super Nintendo that I had as a kid, um, they're not really as exciting now, I guess, but uh, I pumped a ton of hours into those as a kid. Sadly, I don't have my original copies of those in my Nintendo collection. Um, you know, most of my original games as a kid I kept complete in the box, um, so I still have a lot of my originals like Mega Man and stuff like that. But I went through this phase in the 90s where, like, I decided all my Ninja Turtles stuff was for babies, and I sold it all off in garage sales, so... Somebody got nice minty complete copies of those in the 90s, and then they probably threw them away. <laughs> uh, other things that I took away from this is the uh, third Game Boy game, which I had in my collection, but I guess I just never put any time into it, is completely wacko. It's uh, really like a Metroidvania before that was even a thing, and um, really interesting how much in-depth they went with the game level design in that one. Um, I think some of the designers went on to make Symphony of the Night, so obviously it makes sense, but uh, if you really want to play a game that's... Not so much like a, a Ninja Turtles beat-em-up by any means. That one's a lot more in-depth. So kind of enjoyed going through that. Um, just one more last thought on this, too, is, you know, I'm glad they did include the Game Boy games, but I wish they would have at least enabled some of the color palettes for the Super Nintendo games, uh, or Super Game Boy, I should say, um, so you can play them with some color. But instead, they just maintained them as full black and white or monochrome, whatever you want to call it. Um, so it really wasn't that exciting to play those on here when I can play them on console uh, with adapter and the original hardware or with the original cartridges um, and actually get a better, you know, palette with it. So anyways, I'm, I digress. This was worth 20 bucks. It was not worth 40 bucks. So I'm happy to get it for that price. And if anybody else is curious, now's a good time to get it, I guess. Um, let's talk about a very unusual local find I had, and this was just last weekend. Uh, one of my local stores that I don't get out to too often 
Um, apparently got a big Sega Master System trade-in in recent weeks, and uh, I didn't catch it until I was looking for Black Friday sales, and I saw that they posted the collection a few weeks ago on their Facebook page, and I said, man, I need to get over there. Um, so, unfortunately, none of it was on sale, but they did have some really cool stuff in the collection, and what really attracted me was they had a lot of the Euro-exclusive Master System games that actually played just fine on a U.S. system, and they got a lot of cool stuff that we never got here in the U.S., so I'm going to talk about one of those in just a moment. Uh, the first thing I got, though, was another one that I thought was neat. This actually is a U.S. release, but it's a pretty uncommon one, and that is Galaxy Force. And that was a Sega arcade game of the 80s uh, that got ported to the Master System, um, albeit rather poorly. It's uh, definitely, if you've played the arcade game, this is very lacking. You'd have to use your imagination a little bit to see some of the 3D effects or scaling effects, I guess I should say, that it really can't pull off. Um, but, you know, it is kind of interesting, I guess, if you were a fan of the, the arcade game, and this was as good as you could get for a home version. Uh, we did get Galaxy Force 2 on the Sega Genesis, and that one, I think, sold much better than this one. Uh, but I guess Sega themselves didn't even believe in uh, this Master System version, so they, they passed on it. They didn't even release it in the United States, and this was released by uh, Activision. And um, the other thing about that is Activision's Master System releases are all kind of strange in that they have a different color that kind of go against the grain as far as the artwork. So Master System games are known for having the white grid artwork. Uh, the Activision titles have either black or, in this case, this kind of uh, silvery gray color to them. So kind of just stands out on the shelf. I mean, even seeing the spine, you get a different color, and it looks very different to just about anything else in your collection. Um, this one, actually, the Euro version of this is pretty common, and it is just in a plain white box. Uh, but this U.S. version with the Activision publishing it's actually pretty hard to find, and I think um, the store was pricing it as the Euro version because I actually got a really good price on this. So, happy to get this, um, but obviously not one that I'm going to play very much. Uh, the other Master System game, though, I got was on my want list for a long time. This is one that I should have ordered a long time ago. I just really didn't feel like ordering it from Europe and waiting, and so it just got put on the back burner. Uh, but that is the Master System version of Bubble Bobble, and we did not get this in the U.S., unfortunately. Japan got this, and so did Europe. Uh, but we really missed out, is what I will say. So if you are uh, very accustomed to playing Bubble Bobble on the NES, like I am, uh, this is a treat, because it has not just a few extra levels or bonus content, it has a hundred extra levels. So there are a full 200 levels in this game. And if you truly compare uh, the arcade version to some of these home early 8-bit games, um, this one actually maintains a lot more of the power-ups and secrets of the arcade game that the NES version does not have. So this is a really cool version of Bubble Bobble, and uh, very happy to have this in my collection uh, as a big title fan and Bubble Bobble fan, obviously. Uh, but yeah, just a couple other things with this. I think uh, the one thing that it lacks that the NES version does have better is the music. Um, the music in this is kind of the cheesy Master System sound chip, and unfortunately they do it does not support the FM sound chip that uh, makes the Master System sounds game sound good. Um, but the other thing about this is uh, Japan got this game pretty early and it was released as Final Bubble Bobble. Uh, so it really isn't the final game in the series by any means, but I guess they meant final version of the original Bubble Bobble uh, as far as all the enhancements that it had. Uh, so they got it in like 1988 and then when I looked up this Euro version, I don't think this came out until the very end of 91. So there was a huge delay uh, in that market getting this game and maybe one of the reasons why that you don't see this even that often as far as like European Master System games. But uh, this was well worth the money and I'm excited to get it. Um, the one thing I will say is if you are, you know, strictly a US game collector and you still want to play this version, there is still hope. Uh, so the Sega Game Gear version that came out very late on that system is actually this same game uh, with the 100 bonus levels in it as well. And I've had that one for a long time, but I just wanted to play it on a, a proper TV. So. Um, definitely you can check out the Game Gear version of this, and it's equally excellent as far as just, you know, being on a small screen, but it does have all the enhancements that this, this version does too, uh, just due to the Game Gear and Master System being so similar in hardware. So, anyways, uh, this one has cool artwork on it too, so I'm just really happy overall to get this in my collection. Um, you can always tell these Euro Master System games too, because they have multi-languages on the back, so it's like English here, and then German, French, and Spanish, and all that kind of stuff on it. So, they always have this, like, very, very tiny compressed text on the back, which is kind of different to ours. But uh, I might go back and get some more stuff from the store. They have other Master System games that came in in the collection that I don't have in mind. Um, just I was trying to kind of watch the budget that day because it was right around Black Friday spending and bought some other non-related gaming stuff too. So um, We'll talk about Sega CD next. And this came courtesy of the GameSack video that was released during the month that went over in briefly every single game for the Sega CD uh, US library, which uh, I found very useful. 
I've had a pretty big CD Sega CD collection for a while, but even just going through that, I learned about a few games that kind of want to take a little bit more of a look at that I didn't have. So this was one of those, um, and the reason I didn't know about this one is that uh, this is developed by Core Design, which is one of the best designers for the system, according to GameSec, and I would fully agree. Uh, but their branding isn't really anywhere on the case like it typically is. Usually they have their like Core Design logo on the side or something like that, or even on the back. Uh, but this was an earlier release, and I guess that's why. So this one was published by JVC. This is uh, AH3 Thunderstrike, or just Thunderstrike as I think it's known in other countries. Um, and it's, you know, just kind of like a military flight shooter type of thing. I wouldn't call it like a flight sim, but more just like mission-based, I guess, attacks. Um, it definitely has that core design uh, stamp on it where they really try to push the, the Sega CD hardware a lot more than most developers did. And uh, I think for an earlier title, like, they really did a nice job on this one. Um, even just some of the detail they put into this, like, you know, the little cutscenes and all that are kind of interesting. And then um, I thought nice, just a nice touch of, since it's a military-based game, like, when you enter your name, you're actually punching it in onto a dog tag, and then that's <laughs> yours for your character for the game. So just kind of just, you know, nice attention to detail that uh, a lot of these Master or Sega CD games didn't have during the time. Uh, but yeah, just nice to get this one. Cover's kind of bland, uh, but it plays okay, and I think, um, you know, this gets me really close to having all the core design games for the system. Um, obviously, they went on to make things like Tomb Raider later on, but they really weren't known as well known, and I think they took a lot more chances during this era. So, uh, pretty cool European developer that actually made some really good stuff for the Sega CD. Uh, this next one is actually not a game, but it's an enhancement to a game I had already bought. So, if you saw maybe two or three videos ago, I picked up uh, Bonk 3 for the Turbo Graphics, which is one of the pretty expensive and difficult games to find on the Hue Card version. Um, also, the CD version is even rarer, which I don't have that one, but this one was uh, definitely good to find. Uh, the problem is this was one of the later release games that only came in a cardboard box with a manual and the Hue card. You did not get like the nice um, jewel case with the spine and everything like that that uh, the earlier TurboGrafx games had in the U.S. So when I bought this um, from a friend, I got the manual and the Hue card, and I just threw it in a jewel case just to keep it neat. Uh, but what I found on eBay is something that every once in a while I'll catch these, and this guy was selling it just solo, uh, is somebody back in the day, I guess, saw that dilemma of the late Turbo Graphics games not coming with a jewel case, and maybe they wanted it to match their rest of their collection on the shelf, so they took that outer cardboard box and they cut it up to fit a jewel case. So what I bought from the seller was a cut original cardboard Bonk 3 box, uh, that was shaped to fit the jewel case. So it has a nice spine on it there with the logo, and then the back has a good chunk of the cardboard box uh, artwork on it with some of the text. Obviously it won't fully fit in the jewel case, so he just trimmed um, whatever bit they could, I guess, to jam it in the jewel case. So today, yes, that is sacrilege. That original cardboard box is probably worth more than anything else I, I'm even showing you here. Uh, but definitely for piece, piecemealing this one together, it makes it look a lot better on the shelf, and then now it actually has a spine with a label on it. Um, which is definitely an improvement to make it uh, fit in better. So maybe someday I'll get the original outer cardboard box for this, but for now this makes me pretty happy and it didn't cost a whole lot. Um, he's actually got a couple others listed, so I've got my eye on one of the other ones he's selling that uh, would really be the same situation where it would upgrade my uh, my Hue card and manual copy that I have in a jewel case. So kind of sad overall, like I said, that somebody did that um, back in the day, but I guess this was pretty common because I have a few Turbo games in my collection that are like that situation. Uh, last thing I'm going to show you for the month is a couple magazines, and you guys know I like to collect uh, Game Fan magazines, and I got even closer this month to getting a full Game Fan magazine set. And when I say that, I mean even with all the spin-off magazines. So we're going to talk about spin-off magazines <laughs> again that Game Fan put out that were very short-lived. Uh, so I found out about these pretty recently. I did not know about these back in the day because probably they just didn't last that long. And that is the Game Fan Sports Network uh, magazine, which is solely focused on sports games. And I know you're saying, ooh, that does not sound fun to read. Uh, but I actually enjoyed it just in retrospect, I guess for a few reasons. This one has uh, Frank Thomas on the cover. I was a big Frank Thomas fan in the 90s, um, just kind of got into the whole Big Hurt mania, even though I wasn't from Chicago. Uh, but really just thought he was a great player. And uh, this has a pretty interesting interview with him. Um, obviously, he's not a huge uh, hardcore game player, but they did ask him if he ever played his own game, you know, like what he was advertising on the cover here was this poor acclaimed series of uh, Big Hurt baseball games that they put out. And he said, well, actually, yeah, I do. I play the Game Gear version whenever I'm traveling on baseball trips. So 
Uh, can really not picture Big Hurt playing a Game Gear hunched over his uh, game looking at that awful screen, but uh, kind of funny to even think about that as a visual. As far as the magazine itself, I mean, it's okay. It doesn't really have a whole lot of the writers from normal Game Fan, at least under their normal aliases. Um, and they really tried to go all over the place with this first issue. There's a lot of coverage of PC sports games of the era, uh, which isn't really that exciting. And then even just some of the filler that they really put in this magazine to make it uh, work as far as like a thickness of, you know, the normal shelf magazine of the day. So like there's a big history of baseball stadiums in America. I don't know what that has to do with sports video gaming so much. And then towards the end, there's like a section on collecting baseball cards, which, yes, it was very popular during that era, but what does that really have to do with the topic at hand? So I can see why this magazine was not really doomed, uh, was doomed to fail uh, from the get-go, but this is an interesting first issue, and I, I found it on eBay, so I was happy to get it. Then, of course, that put me down the rabbit hole of needing to get all of these, and I think I have a full set of these, but there's so little information about some of these spinoff magazines, I wouldn't be surprised if there actually is any more. Uh, but this is issue two, and this one is all about uh, Quarterback Club 98 on the N64 big deal. Uh, this issue, they tried to refine the concept a little bit more, a little bit more focus on just the sports titles. Um, there is still a card collecting uh, little, you know, side column, but not really that much about that or other diversion topics. Um, and then I think they fixed, like, kind of their scoring system and how they wrote the, the previews were a little more consistent with normal game fan with this issue. Uh, but they must not have believed in this or just didn't sell the newsstand because I don't think they uh, ever made any more beyond this. I don't even remember seeing like a subscription card for this, so maybe they were just testing it out in small markets. Uh, but I don't think that these got very big distribution because I've definitely never seen them in person uh, before. And this one also came from eBay. So happy to get another Game Fan spinoff uh, subset complete. I think if I get the final Game Fan issue I need, which is very difficult to find, um, I will have all of the Game Fan magazines with the exception of like their strategy guides, which I'm not going to go for the set of those. So. Anyways, um, yeah, just this is what happens when you start chasing magazine collecting. It's just as dangerous, if not more, than game collecting because there's so little information about some of these and uh, just, you know, finding these out in, in the wild is pretty hopeless. So you just have to hope on somebody on eBay cl cleaning out their closet, basically. Uh, but that about does it. So, like I said, not a whole lot of stuff uh, this month. I'm actually hoping to get the game room cleaned up a little bit with some of the uh, shuffling around I'm doing, and hopefully we'll have a video showing you some of the changes that I'm working on with that uh, here shortly as well. So, thank you very much for watching. Please take a moment, like, comment, subscribe, let me know what you think, and I will talk to you soon. Have a great day or night, wherever you are.